Hello, I'm Michael Gutensan. I am co-founder of Volumetrics. And I'm Luan, Luan Bouman, the other co-founder of Volumetrics. Yeah, and uh, Volumetrics is a, a spatial web startup. Uh, Laurent's not a huge fan of that term, but I'll say the buzzwords if I have to. So yeah, we thought we'd start doing this podcast just to talk about what's going on in the space and to give people like quick updates on what we're working on, our progress. We have a newsletter already, but we figured this would be a very convenient way to start keeping people up to date as well. So we also want to talk about the Vision Pro, obviously. We're both former Apple employees, both from different eras, but we still have similar and often differing opinions as well. So we will take some time to discuss that after a quick recap on things we've been working on. So to start off, we have some updates on MRJS. Just some quick things. We updated to the latest version of 3JS, which is like our core graphics library. Shout out to Mr. Doob. He's doing great work. But we're on R161 now, which brought improved colors, performance, and some nice UX features in the Quest browser. And also, we made some interaction bug fixes. And of course, we're continuing to build out our CSS support. We've added visibility, the visibility property, and we're bringing back animations. They were deprecated for a minute because we had some performance issues with them, but we've resolved those and those should be back quite soon and other various bug fixes. And I'll pass over to Laurent uh, to talk about some hackathon and MRJS. We'll like, create MRJS updates. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually pretty excited. So this weekend, we're running a hackathon. It's only going to be internal for now, but it's going to be the first time that some people go use the documentation docs.mrjs.io in context with trying to build something cool on, on the framework that they never used before. And along with that, we built a REPL, I don't remember what the acronyms mean, but this online editor that one of our assumption core to Volumetrics is that the development toolchain will move in headset and we want to move it to headset. So that would be the first time that we'll see people actually using in headset the, the editor and see how it goes. And so we, we built a small like web app right now that does like JavaScript, CSS and HTML editing and we'll see and assets upload and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, like uh, we're hoping that it's going to be like the foundation to our core platform that we'll be working on quite soon. But I also just looked up what REPL stands for and it's a read eval print loop. So great. the more you know, we know it now. Um, I thought the word editor was definitely going to be in there. So I was surprised. But yeah, no, I'm excited about it. I have lots of opinions on how the UX of like building in headset. So I've been trying to be unbiased and like let you build that because like we'll we'll fight on ideas like constantly until we get to a great solution and we need to move fast right now. To be fair, I'm just going to ask people to code in the editor that supports editing in headset and we'll see how many people actually go and do it in headset or prefer the laptop. We want and it to we'll go ask to headset. Questions. Like we want them in headset like or at least I want them in headset. So hopefully we get there sooner rather than later. We really want to improve that quality of life. But anyways, those are the updates. We're going to go ahead and jump into like our main conversations. We did want to do a quick recap of the WebXR meetup that we presented at about a week ago. We gave the update in our newsletter as well as like the full recording and the demo we gave. But we figured a quick like five minute chat about it would be great. I personally thought it went really well. It was cool that it was in this like immersive space. It was like framevr.io and I'll share out the link to that in the video description I mean, wherever we uh, end up hosting this podcast. But like it, it was really fun. We got a lot of great feedback because it was like from people who are deeply invested in the immersive web and WebXR community. And they asked a lot of questions that we've been asking ourselves, but hearing other people ask them as well really helps us out. And it helped us highlight the difference between our library and other existing libraries where we're very focused on kind of like bootstrapping and like like responsive UI, like spatial web apps that can also be run on a 2D browser, as well as like just a real focus on UI because most libraries out there have like no real UI support. You basically have to build everything out yourself. But how do you think it went? Yeah, no, I I, I will echo that uh, as a as a designer with a an engineering interest that 
know and understand like HTML, CSS, some JavaScript. I, 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 I'm fascinated by if you want to build a 2D website, you just go on like MSDN or W3C and there's like, here's how you make an image. Here's how you make, create a link. Like it's all the standard. It's all like very, very well exposed. Uh, now if you want to build a special website, a 3D website, like there's nothing. There's like libraries, proprietary stuff, but it's like a wall. There, there's no standard. There's no W3C page that will talk about the, the ease of use. So I, I think what we're building is really the missing spot between like nothing and full like Unity style ID and, and, and seeing what we could build in a week in terms of demos was, was really fascinating from like simple flexbox, like grid style layout to fairly complex immersive like scenes all in an HTML-like language, I think, like, unlock for me and for, I think, a whole class of designers, like, the special web. Yeah, I think, like, and, and there are, like, I just want to clarify, there are existing, like, libraries, and there is, like, the WebXR standard, as well as WebGL and soon-to-be WebGPU. And, again, 3JS is amazing. But, like, there's not something that truly allows, like, developers, like, designers slash developers like yourself that, like, allow for a slow ramp into the spatial web era. Um, and I'd say that in air quotes, but it's like you don't have that easy transition from like HTML and CSS to maybe a little bit of immersive content to more immersive to very immersive. So like that's what we really captured in the demo. And I really appreciated that. Like you built those first two demos and then I, having just a little bit more experience, took your code and built off of it to add like, the tabletop experience and the room scale experience. But really, like, there wasn't a huge amount of difference between, like, my code and your code. It was just building off, progressing off of each other. And I really want to capture that as we move forward in every demo, if we can, is just showing how simple it is to build these things out. Um, Yeah, yeah. and I don't know what you think, but I, I do believe that the transition to the special web it's going to happen like one page at a time. If somebody has a portfolio, it's already built, it's already 2D in HTML, they might add one page with some special stuff. They they don't necessarily want to rebuild the whole thing in a new system, like an incremental improvement on their website. And I think like, what yeah. we're building is exactly for that. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, I would hope that they just completely rebuild their whole thing in MRJS, but that's just like my zealot behavior. You're you're probably closer to right than I am. I think the whole web should be built on MRJS, but mm-hmm. it'll be some time before that kind of thing starts happening. Yeah, other things to highlight, it was just, like I said, a lot of great questions. The demo was really fun to build, ramping up to it. Yeah, and the, the last thing I, I would like to add is that uh, the WebXR community on Discord was awesome. Like, we got yeah. a lot of good en- engagement, good feedback. I mean, everybody was super supportive and like asking very interesting questions. And, and I really appreciate and, and, and thank that community. Yeah. And uh, that's like another great thing we got out of that is there is a channel on the WebXR Discord for MRJS. We're trying to be more active on there. We got people to join our own Discord. And we actually have a few people trying to build projects on top of MRJS now that we're coordinating with to like help them out as our early adopters. So there's cool stuff in the pipeline. Like I, I won't like hint at it too much just yet because there's still things that are being ideated on, but more to come. And I'm very excited about it. But with with that in mind, let's, I guess, get into our main discussion And full disclosure, we like recorded this or tried to record this podcast before we tried to record it yesterday, but it didn't catch the audio. So a lot of this conversation will be like a little less heated, I guess. Like we had we really went into the debate about it, but we'll we'll still try and capture that energy. I think there's parts we still agree, agree or disagree on, but we'll get into it. But we really like as we said at the beginning and as the title implies, we're two ex-Apple employees. I worked on the Vision Pro for four years. Laurent, like you worked on early Mac day OS. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mac OS 10 years ago. Yeah. And so like we both have opinions on like different eras of Apple and like the ethos is still like roughly the same, at least they preach it to be. And like having worked on it, but I left right after WWDC and like seeing it for the first time, we do have one. 
like I had thoughts on how it changed. There's not much changed since I left, but it was just really cool to hold it again, having that time between. And of course, I'm going to want your thoughts. You haven't tried it yet, but we're going to, I'm going to try and get you into the headset today. For um, sure. But I guess, yeah, my first thoughts, like I was, since like it was delivered to my house and uh, like I was the one to open it up, I definitely got like a little bit emotional. Like just like it was like there's this thing that I worked with and a little on for four years. Like I was a prototyper, so like I didn't build the thing, but like I had some input and gave like feedback and filed issues with the teams that were really building things. So having like worked with it, for so long, it was very like cool to see it out in the world and being delivered in a box to my home. So that part of it was awesome. And like, it was just cool to see something finally go from close to the beginning to launch. And that was a great experience for me. But once like, I got it into my hand, not much changed from the last time I saw it, like from WWDC, like every everything that was like shown at WWDC was more or less the stuff I knew about. And yeah, it's it's a cool device. I will say that it's heavy. It's a lot like the weight distribution on it is very different from the Quest. What they didn't have internally was that headband. Like there's a dual loop headband that distributes distributes the weight better than like the weird one that it first comes with. I like the weird one in terms of like the adjustment because it's just so easy to put it on. But the weight distribution is totally wrong. So you can't really wear it for that long unless you're like really into it. And I'm really into it. So also, yeah, yeah. physics still matters. Like a little bit. Like having yeah. having something on top of your head might yeah. not be great for your hair. Yeah. But great for weight distribution. Yeah. It's it's awesome to like be able to have that now. And also like I have like kind of like high cheeks. And so and I, when I smile, I smile with my like cheeks. And like, like it's very full faced. So putting the headset on and then doing the persona thing, I called like my grandparents and my mom, like using like the personas, which are still in beta. And I just updated to the latest beta and they have improved a little bit. But still, when I smile, it looks like I'm being held hostage. Like, and I'm just trying to say, I'm fine, please help or whatever. But like that part is still cool. It's still in development. It has improved since I last saw it. But compared to like the Quest 3, Quest Pro, the software is definitely better. The displays are better, but the weight is just like, it's it's significantly more noticeable. I think they don't, it doesn't weigh much more. It's just the distribution that like really gets to you. But I think like, yeah, WebXR support is disappointing. And it's something like, I think we all knew, like they, they, like announced it separately that it will be supported, but it's behind a flag initially. And even with that flag, a lot of features are unavailable. Like you don't get the pass through and you don't even get like the hand clipping that you get with native apps. And that's disappointing. Like we are very focused on like mixed reality. And I kind of knew that leaving that Apple would do something like that because they're not huge supporters of the web. Well, yeah. if if I can start my rant now, I think <laughs> this is the biggest difference from... Apple from 10, 15 years ago, where when the first iPhone came out, Steve was on stage basically saying the web was the SDK. And I remember as somebody building things for the web, the number of things that use the WebKit prefix in CSS, because like Safari was ahead of everything. If you want rounded corner, if you want like box shadows or things like that, you, you, you had to use like the Safari WebKit prefixes because like they were ahead on the web and the web was a, this important part of the iOS experience. But since then, Apple discovered like the 30% tax and the, the power of the app store and the power of locking down their users to a point where it seems clear now that the web is like the enemy of the Vision Pro. And, and I think like crippling the web is part of the strategy to like make sure people build native apps and make sure people like build things that are on the app store. And I think like, that's a shame. That's a little sad. Yeah, I'd agree for, with a lot of that. Like, and again, I want to emphasize, like, I'm very like proud to have worked on this device. I think it's going to help like, you know, like build out this ecosystem now that we have another major player in the space. But like, you're right. Like, I, I think we've talked, we've talked about it before. I think Safari 
is the new Internet Explorer in that it's the the slowest like buffalo in the herd and every web developer because iOS dominates the US has to like, you know, limit their abilities like for their products, for their web apps in order to make sure that Safari remains supported. Like when I was building like my uh, master's thesis, we were really focused on like like having a web VR experience that could be experienced on a phone to like what was then just the Quest One. And in order to support like the car- like Google Cardboard format on what was then the, I think, iPhone ten like we had to like really limit features because back then Safari on mobile, I think limited you to maybe 50 megabytes per tab. I might be wrong on that, but it was like we had to do some significant optimizations in order to make sure that this experience we were building could run in a cardboard headset because it's very fo- like we, I mean, even in our own company now, we're very focused on accessibility and not just accessibility from like, like, you know, like an ability standpoint, like differently abled people, but from a like class standpoint, like we need to people who can't afford the vision pro, but can not afford a quest or just like have access to a MacBook should have access to this space. Like it's like unfair to like lock out an entire group of people because the more people working in it, and that's part of our whole thesis is like the more people who are building for this space, the more people who have access like the better, like the more likely we are to come to like the thing, like what the killer app yeah, is. Let's yeah, let's be honest, there's not yet like killer apps on on the WebXR. Like we on need, XR in general. On XR yeah, in general, yeah. we need to empower developer to like build those experiences. And the lower the entry point is, the better it is for everybody. Cause like Apple the Vision Pro will benefit from somebody building a WebXR app that changes the world or that yeah. create a use case that is like very, very desirable for that kind of devices. Yeah, and like, yeah. again, XR in general, but like up until now, the tooling for XR has been native and it's been game engines. And now we have Xcode, but like, I mean, you go look at Xcode on the App Store. It's got like, it's one of the top downloaded apps. I think it's like, on like the Mac App Store, top downloaded app but one of the worst ratings because you have to use Xcode in order to build natively. You have no choice, so there's no competition, so they have no reason to build a better developer experience. But building out like a more familiar developer experience like is crucial and something that's more accessible is crucial so that, like you said, people can find those use cases because you look like desktop computing to mobile computing, and I've said this multiple times, like the desktop only really took off when the web hit. Like when like browsers came around and HTML was defined and JavaScript was written in a week or if it was really written in a week and people were able to say, oh, this is like I can build for this thing now. It's very easy to build a web page. It's very easy to like add some JavaScript and some styling and I can distribute it quickly to other people rather than having to go at the time sell my software through a distributor, through a store like Best Buy or like what was Circuit City in a box. Yeah, you don't have to ship things in a box. And you didn't have to do that for like, I think it was like 15, 20 years until like like the iPhone came around and then the app store hit and then people had to go through the app store because they started choking the web. But the web, even for mobile, like defined the UX of mobile. Like it's the great incubator of every platform so far. Like, albeit there's been two major platform shifts. But both times, the web developers went in and figured out what the thing was for. And to me, like, my hypothesis is that you cannot skip that step. That is a crucial step for any new form factor. If you do not have that incubation period where there is no lock-in, there is no walled garden, then you're not going to, like, have those killer apps. You're not going to have, like, people working together to figure out how like these things operate, especially if they have to write a version of their app that like, okay, it fits this platform, but it doesn't fit that platform. I have to write like something specifically for Quest. I have to write something specific for the Vision Pro. And like things like Unity and Unreal like have those abilities where they can like cross compile to either like platforms. But like they're also really inaccessible tools. Like, I mean, and this is about the Vision Pro, but like the developer experience overall 
it's they're not improving it by much. They're improving it a little bit. Like, yeah, th- th- that's also like a meta disappointment that I have not just on the on the Vision Pro, but on the class of in general, like the Quest Three, the, the when like when the iPhone and the iPad came out, like Steve was talking about how the the Macintosh computers are like trucks. And uh, not everybody need a truck. And now people need cars and like the iPad and the iPhone and all those like lighter, more consumption oriented devices are like cars, not trucks. Great. But when do we get a better truck? Why? Like XR is such a better input device and monitor technology. Like you get an infinite screen, you get like great, powerful gestures that could be put to the service of a much better truck. But neither Apple nor Meta want to build a better truck. They want to build like wall garden of their old own owning. And like nobody wants to build a VR truck. And I'm craving for a VR truck, a better computer. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I, and that was, I mean, my disappointment as well. I was always hoping, even before I had joined Apple, I was hoping they'd one day, one day build a Mac for your face. And, like, it's unfortunate, and, like, other people have said it, it's an iPad for your face. And the iPad is interesting. It's cool. It should have, in my I, my opinion, replaced, like, the low-end MacBook or the MacBook Air. But it can't because there's all these abilities that you just don't have on an iPad. Like I tried to live off of an iPad for a little bit just to see what the experience was like. I had a desktop at home. I would carry my iPad with me. And as soon as I needed to do like very specific things for my job as a developer, I couldn't do it. Like, or if anytime I needed access to the file system, like unzipping a file, unzipping a file. Yeah. 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 It was impossible. I've read many, many times, like people trying to leave off of an iPad and give up and go back to a Mac because at the end of the day, like there are things that you need to do on a computer that Apple would rather you don't do and like accessing the file system. Ooh. Yeah. But I, I think we're, we're not going to be able to move really to a XR world before there are like XR computers. Yeah. And I think like that's the problem we're trying to solve, you know, going like to like a cloud-based system. And Apple will like, I think I'm confident once like the next iteration comes out, once the like cheaper version inevitably comes out, like with all of the like DMA stuff happening over at the EU, the Digital Markets Act, forcing Apple's hand into like actually allowing competitors onto their platform like, even though they're not doing that in the U.S., much to my dismay, like, I find malicious compliance just a little entertaining, but mm-hmm. also very disappointing. Like, well, at the very least, we'll get the trickle-down effect where, like, Apple has to build a better browser in order to compete with Blink and Firefox, like, uh, the Gecko engine, all of that, like, Chrome, rather than just having, like, what I like to call Tanuki Safari, where it's safari in a fox costume or safari in a chrome costume because everything's just webkit right now but hopefully like like my expectation is once this device becomes viable like people like it's actually more than like the very wealthy and early adopters hands like there will be better web xr support but ultimately i just don't see apple taking the majority of the market right now or even in the next five, 10 years, I think the Quest, like our target market are Quest users because like one, Meta has been great about a dot, like say what you want about Meta. I have my misgivings about them and like their whole metaverse approach. I'm pretty anti-metaverse, but they're very good about adopting standards for their browser. And like, they're very like interactive with the community. They'll talk about it. Like I've been able to like file bugs directly via Discord with some of the people who are working on the Quest browser. And so ultimately, since we're targeting the web and we're trying to build that developer experience that like makes it more like a real computer, it's going to be for the Quest users. Because also, frankly, there are more Quests out there than they're going to be Vision Pros or Vision devices for a bit forever probably if yeah. it follows like iPhone market share or Mac market share like yeah. the Quest the Vision Pro might be like 10-15% market share globally which, yeah. globally yeah. yeah but I think uh, in the US even like Quest has got such a head start whereas like the iPhone like like got the head start correct and I yeah, think yeah. like that makes sense that like 
the iPhone took the market and iOS took the market in the US because they just had such a like foothold and head start on all of these things. Like Google didn't come out with Android until like a year or two later. And like even then, Android didn't become viable until like a couple of years later. It didn't become a true competitor, I would say, until very recently, within like the last like 10 years. And so like, yeah, it's like with the Quest having such a head start. And I will say that the Quest software, like the operating system is nowhere near as like refined as the Vision Pro. I'm hoping they get better. But there are things we are doing better in our own like, they library. Get better. Yeah. Like Apple is going to put pressure on them on polish yeah. and finish, which is great. Yeah, com- uh, competition. It's like great. But like, I think the hardware in terms of like the comfort is better. But like, I think we've ranted enough about WebXR support. I think we should get into like the like a core like disagreement we had initially. But I think I managed to bring you over to my side yesterday, at least a little bit. Whereas like I, in one of our meetings suggested, and I posted about this on like LinkedIn and Twitter as well, that the Vision Pro, everyone keeps comparing it to the Apple Watch. I think it's more like the original Macintosh. And like, I'll I'll make my point really quick on that. And like, even if I was able to convince you, I I hope you'd still like reiterate your stance against the thought. Yeah, not sure I'm fully convinced. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah, it's, and by all means, voice it. But like, To me, the Apple Watch, at the very least, even though it was a completely new form factor and people didn't know how it was different from a normal watch and what the value like it had was, at least it served a function that people already like were used to using. Like it was replacing your watch and it was a watch. It told the time. Whereas like the Vision Pro doesn't quite like fit a use case that people already have like that they're used to using every day like people are not like they're not glasses because it's like i don't know like 10 times as heavy as the glasses you're wearing right now and like you can't see through it it doesn't improve your vision or anything like that you have to buy lenses in order for it to like fit your vision yeah and it lasts an hour yeah and it lasts an hour like so if like you were wearing it as glasses like these guys in their cyber trucks and like walking around the streets of new york wearing their vision pro like They'll walk around for an hour and a half at most and immediately just go blind. I call it the death simulator. Like as soon as like the battery dies, screen goes black and this is what it's like to be dead, I guess. But no, like it, like with the headset, it's not like they're trying to like kind of shoehorn it in into like media consumption, like watching TV, going to the movies, things like that. But I don't think that quite works. And like I'll I'll state my reason why, but like it's more similar to the Macintosh in that case, where it's like it's a vision of the future of what this thing can be. And it's not like a brand new thing. Like people have known about mixed reality. There have been mixed reality devices for years, but they're all really focused on gaming and industrial use cases, mostly industrial because like mixed reality, augmented reality was like just not ready for like a gaming form factor just yet. And like a consumer form factor, like consumer was all virtual reality. But these things have existed in some form for 10 years now in in terms of like actually building something for the market. The ideas have existed for like decades. And that's very similar to the Macintosh where it's like computers, like small form factor computers had been around for maybe like a decade prior to the Macintosh. The Macintosh was like the first one that was like targeted at families. It was first tar- one targeted at like the average consumer, at least a little bit. And that was exciting. And that's exciting about the Vision Pro. But like the Macintosh, for, at least from what I know, like, I mean, I wasn't around when it was first released. I just know a lot about the history. Just didn't, people didn't know what to do with it yet. And it's the same thing with the Vision Pro. Like it's this great visionary device and people just don't know how to figure it out or what it's for. and like at least this time apple has the advantage of being a multi-trillion dollar company so they can like give it time to figure it out but the macintosh took 20 years to really understand what it was for yeah see for for me well so first in in to go back to your points the 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 apple watch is of the three devices the only device that is trying to replace something the apple watch is trying to replace your watch and i have a watch on the wrist right now and the only way you can at least replace that device is to like the table stake is to give the time. So it's not like 
it was doing something better than my watch, but it had to do that for me to even consider switching. Now the Mac and the Vision Pros are not like replacing things that you already had. I will be, I, I will fight back on the fact that when the Mac came out, there was a lot of people, there were already some computers. There were no personal computers. The idea of a computer that is your own was brand new. But I do think that the publishing industry, that the Mac came out with Mac Paint and with things that instantaneously like brought values to people. Like the first Mac, it was a pretty expensive device, but the first Mac came out with like all the tool you needed for personal computing, for publishing, for writing text, for sending faxes, for whatever you needed with a programming language. So you could like, not only like do things that you needed to do, but also like build new things where I don't think the Vision Pro is coming out with like a I mean, there, use case that is as strong as like the publishing industry or like the, the scientific community. There are some like things that are there. Like they have this app called uh, Freeform that's interesting. It's like a big whiteboarding app. I think it's it's very it's got some keynote like features in there. And I'm not the biggest fan of keynote. I don't think there is a huge fan of Keynote out there other than like Apple employees. And even that's debatable because when I was there, I was like, why can't I just use Google Slides? Google Slides is better. It's easier to distribute it. But like, it's it's interesting. It's like a whiteboarding experience. I have played around with it a little bit, but you're right in the sense that it's like, at least the Mac was like, it had some functionality that sort of replaced things. And also it was lighter than its com- competitors. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was so... It, it was fitting on someone's desk, which was not the case of other computers at the time, which I think was... Like, it was a a polished personal computer that came with a mouse and a graphical user interface, which was, like, mind-blowing at the time. Yeah. Um, and, like, I mean, they stole it from Xerox, but, like, I, they added sure. some great improvements. Um, yeah. But I, I like... I think the similarity there is still that like, yeah, they're like, like I said, like the Vision Pro, it's not the first device of its kind as much as they want to like say it is. There have been other headsets out there on the market that are bigger, heavier. You have to plug it into a computer or it's like not as like the pass through isn't as good. Like the Quest 3 pass through is like maybe 80% there. And I think it's improving over time as they do new software updates. But it's definitely not as good because they don't have the same displays. They don't have like the same compute power. But like, yeah, like similar to the Mac, the Vision Pro like is supposed to be the better version of things that existed. And the same with the iPhone. It's supposed to be the better version of things that existed. But I think I said this yesterday and like I hadn't really thought about it until I said it. Like the Mac you could share with people. Like if you had something on your screen that you wanted to show someone, you could you could say, hey, come look at this thing. And there was no trouble of like a person walking up to your desk and looking at that thing. And that's like been true for personal computing for like since the Mac. But with the Vision Pro, it's a very isolating experience. Yeah, it's that's individual. You cannot share it with anyone else, really. That's actually something I, I was in that agency when the sunflower, the the new Macintosh with the like half round base and the 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 chrome like arm, and uh, it was a revolution in the office because I remember like the ability to turn your screen around to ask like people behind you or in front of you or like hey what do you think of that like should I improve that do you like the color like being able to easily like swivel your computer to show like people around something was like like amazing and and I think a lot of people still love the 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 sunflower for that and I feel like yeah the vision pro or like headsets in general have this problem of like it's unshareable like you have an infinite screen but only you can see it yeah like and you know I hadn't seen it in a couple like months in like six or seven months since like it was announced or like at WWDC from like that time between like I left and receiving it. So I kind of got to see it with new eyes and there were features I didn't know about or I just never got around to playing with. Um, I was very focused on like doing my developer gig. But like, you know, there's features like the environments, like where you can like slowly immerse yourself. Those are cool. And like, it's really exciting. The moon one was the one I was most excited about because I'm a huge space nerd and like going to the moon would be amazing. But 
like you it's very photorealistic it's got depth it's like it feels real and you'll see it I'll, I'll, again I'll, I'll i will get you in headset but it's like after that kind of like wears off like you're alone on the moon like it's very isolating and in any of the other environments it feels the same way like it's amazing you're awestricken at the quality but at the end of the day you are there alone and if you're watching a movie in one of these environments, you are watching this movie alone. Whereas like with, I guess, a TV, you you can watch it with someone else. You can sit down on the couch and you can watch a movie together. So to me, it doesn't replace your TV. And it doesn't like, I don't know, like even the Quest supports like local, like local, I guess, co-presence or interaction. Like that's the like the like industry term where you can like be in the same room and if like there's a virtual object on the table, you both see that virtual object. I don't think the Vision Pro can do that yet. I mean, I haven't tried because it's $3,500 and the like I, the likelihood of two people have it, like being in the same room and having one of these devices is pretty low. Yeah. That's actually, that's interesting. If you think about like the future that they're proposing both Meta and Apple, Meta in the Quest 3 introduction announced like those augments where you can have like your Instagram feed on the living room and you can have like the weather on the mirror. Currently, they're like single player experiences. Now, I assume the, the, there, there are questions around, but the idea was that if somebody come to your place with a headset on, if your wife use a different headset, like are the augment like persistent and visible to everybody and like part of your your house or are they and will always be like a single player experience if they are shared does that mean that no everybody in a household need to have the same like brand of headsets to like share the same augments in the house currently like there are household with android and iphones or with like are we are we creating a, a world where everybody in the same house need to have the same brand and same OS of headsets for us, for them to share like a, a, that virtual layer on top of their house. And does that mean in the morning you put your headset on and you just walk in your house like with a headset on like all the time? Like that, that seems to be the premise, but yeah, we'll see how that goes. I think like that you're highlighting a good point there is like, I think interoperability is going to be absolutely paramount for this class of device, like more so than like, like mobile and desktop, mobile and desktop. I guess you can sort of have your like walled garden a little bit and not have like a huge issue. Like as long as you can like message each other, like text message, iMessage is a big thing in the US, like where like I actually run blue, like I switched to Android full, full disclosure. I wanted a folding phone. I'd been on iPhone for a while and in order to like maintain the group chats I had with people that I like cared about, I spun up Blue Bubbles, which is an app that allows you to like, you know, like kind of host it, like host a Mac server at home and it like will route your Blue Bubble messages like to your Android phone. And it's great. It works. It's a very engineering oriented to sit like like solution. And like, I happen to be an engineer, so it wasn't too bad to set up, but I don't imagine like anyone else doing it. But that's besides the point. It's like in order to like truly make sure that like people are seeing the same things, because like this is like even more like you'll notice lock in immediately wearing like the future like glasses from Meta and the future glasses oh, you would be from like Apple. Personally locked in. Yeah. Like, almost like physically locked in. That yeah. System. It's like, it's like, it's, you are like, it's isolating already. Like you hear kids like complain about it all the time where it's like, if I have an Android phone, I'm like locked out of group chats. So imagine them wearing glasses where it's like, I have the Android or meta glasses and everyone else has the Apple ones. So they're literally seeing things I don't see. And that's like that highlights a very big problem in this like current ecosystem. And like, I guess like to get back to it, I would still say it's very so like getting like back to the original point of like, is it a Mac or is it an Apple watch? I still think it's a Mac where it's like, it's a vision of the future. It's going to take much longer than the Apple watch did it, uh, to like I, take off in my opinion. My conclusion will be it's neither. It's another iPad. Fair. But that's a we'll good see. point. Like that's that's I didn't like y y you're not wrong, but you're not totally right. Just like I like I'd say the Mac 
a comparison isn't totally right either for that exact reason. But like, I think, and to clarify, I'm a totally big believer in this space. I think that it's going to take off for the quest. I think it is already starting to take off for the quest. I am like, I, what's the term? Not suspicious, but skeptical. like skeptical. That's the one. Skeptical about like the Vision Pro and its vision of the future, how long that will take to take off. Yeah, it will. Yeah. I, I'm actually seeing Netflix right out say like they're not going to build a native app for, for uh, and they're going to disable the iPad app. Yeah. Like there seems to be a little bit of a resistance this time around to like, create apps dedicated like i think the 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 developer experience reach a point where no you have to build like those extremely fat binary where you have like the ios app and the ipad app and the watch app and now like the tv os app and the vision pro app and people are gonna keep building variation of the same app until like they get tired and they say i want to build one run everywhere and i mean we saw the rise of electron and and all those like web apps because the web is the way to build one and run everywhere yeah discord uh, slack like v- Figma, vs code vs code like all those tools are yeah. like web or electron yeah like it's all it's it's just a website underneath yeah, and I think the I, I think there is this time around more of a pushback that there was for iOS on companies like just tired of taking a thirty percent like cut and having to be like for one more technology and one more engineering team and one more specialist in the engineering team. So we'll see how it goes. I will say it's a very bad time for them, like to be going through this like litigation and like like a lot of like scrutiny about their app store policies just as they're launching a new form factor. Right. And I think their response to it is deeply problematic and is only making it worse. It's only highlighting the like fact that they're not the good guy in this situation. The malicious compliance is just like, how is that good for your brand? Like at all, like Apple is supposed to be the friendly, like, like platform. It's supposed to be the one that like everyone uses. And it's like, I know that their argument is like privacy and security, but I've never believed that. I'm like, this is you, you want the, you want that 30%. This is is protecting their income. And and Uh, that's, that's clear. But like, it seems clear to everybody now, which maybe was not the case 10 years ago. Like, I think there was still the benefit of the doubt that, Apple is the good guy. And then I think the mask is off now with all that regulation and seeing like everything that came out in the orch room against the Google or whatever, that they're 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 not the good yeah. guy anymore. And like I I want part of me wants Apple to win. Like because their hardware, like I would say in many cases, is better. Like their chips are amazing. I love my MacBook Air. Like it's like leaps and bounds better than my Intel Mac. But I want them to win based on merit, not lock in. And like, I'm a huge believer in competition. Like if you're blocking out competition, you have no incentive to build a better product. So I I want the app store like lock in to go away. I would like like the US to take on some of the policies that the EU is introducing. So Apple is forced to compete and genuinely build a better product because like Safari, like the App Store, like all of their like built-in features, iMessage, iMessage is a great product. I do not think they need lock-in for it. And I think they could even take the market away from WhatsApp if they launched an Android version. Like it is a great app. It's a great experience for like messaging. And like, I think it's better than WhatsApp in many ways. But like it's only for a specific device. And that's tragic because like they'd be a great competitor in that space. But I want them to win on merit. I want to see them innovate more. And I would say at least on the software side, on their services, they're not innovating like anywhere near as much as they used to. It's not like the app store is not a value add that it was when they first launched it. It's now a lock-in. It's now... They treat their developers kind of poorly, then that's putting it mildly. And like, if your developers are unhappy, then you're not going to have a new platform. So if they want people to adopt Vision OS, they have to really incentivize people to get on that platform and start building for it. But we're all pretty jaded as developers. There's like, your tools suck. 
The process of getting an app on your store sucks. Navigating your policies and making sure that like I fit your vision of what is right and what is wrong. And like full disclosure, I kind of agree with them on a lot of what is right and what is wrong in terms of like data privacy, et cetera, at least what they're preaching. But like I also believe people should be allowed to like make that decision on their own. But people yeah. want, it seems like, at least in the Apple ecosystem, people want a benevolent dictator. They want to be, they want to be protected and told what's allowed, what's not allowed. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's very dangerous. Like any, any type of dictatorship, air quote, is dangerous, even if it's benevolent for decades. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I would hope that, that Europe keep digging on Apple's case and like force them to allow PWA on the App Store, for them to allow browser engines like worldwide side loading and, and then eventually maybe force iOS and iPad OS and all those something OS being like general computing platforms. Yeah. I like they should be. They should be general computing platforms. And I think I'll I guess we can like wrap it at like the verge like contentiously and I like I love their podcast I listen to it quite a bit like every week they gave like Neil I Patel the chief editor he gave the Vision Pro a 7 like out of their review system they're very like diligent and like they have a defined process for reviewing a product and they like they've got an ongoing joke, whereas you never give a product a seven. It's either a six or an eight. It forces you to choose something. And they gave it a seven. And they were arguing back and forth about like it's thirty five hundred dollars. It shouldn't be go over a six. I don't think like price point aside, even if it were super cheap, even if we're the same price as the Quest, to me, you got to take a point off for the fact that it doesn't have a functioning browser like it's got a browser but it's not a good browser it doesn't adopt full standards people can't do what they want with it so if you're not like if you can't use the web to its full extent then it's not a general computing platform it's a it's an appliance it's a device for very specific use cases that happens to have a browser on it. I could not see myself with this device. I can see myself on a Quest, like because Quest, you can sideload apps. I'm sure they'll allow another app store on eventually. So I can see myself using a Quest as a general computing platform more than I can see myself using a Vision Pro as a general computing platform. Like I, again, can't emphasize enough. I'm proud of the work that I did. I was really happy to work with the people who built it. And like I look forward to seeing how things shape out. I would not recommend people buy one. So I think like, yeah, let's, let's close out there. We're already, we've already gone way longer than I expected us to. So we'll, we'll wrap up with some final notes, just like some miscellaneous things. More MRJS improvements are in the pipeline. We just added multi-plane support. We're improving our physics implementation, our interaction implementation, cleaning up our docs. We're running the hackathon uh, this yeah, weekend. Yeah, I think we, yeah, we're running one hackathon this weekend. It's going to be the 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 starting point of I hope like a series of hackathon, hopefully like twice a month, having like really interesting like prompts and interesting demos that get built is is I think very exciting to me. Yeah, I, I, and like I'm excited about it too. I'm more excited to see what people build. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I'd be devastated if they don't build anything at all. But that's a data point. And like, I'm interested to see how they build and how we can improve that process, which, you know, gets us to our next point of like, we're st like through these hackathons, we're also starting to work on the platform. We're figuring out what features need to be there. Like, I'm hoping that this, like this tool that we built specifically for these hackathons will become like the seed to a much larger tool and set of tools that will enable people to build for this space cheaper, faster, better. And, you know, design, develop, deploy, like the rule of three, like we've got a lot to come in the pipeline. I'm looking forward to seeing everything that happens in the next few months. And we're going to try and do these podcasts a little more regularly. We'll yep. see how it works. But I think that's it for the week. Catch you guys next time. And yeah. Thanks, everybody. Peace. Peace.